If Thomas Jefferson rode to the White House on the shoulders of slaves, Andrew Jackson rode to the White House in the arms of the people. By the people, Jackson meant the newly enfranchised workingman, the farmer and the factory worker, the reader of newspapers. In office, he pursued a policy of continental expansion, dismantled the National Bank, and narrowly averted a constitutional crisis over the question of slavery. He also extended the powers of the presidency. Though we live under the form of a republic, Justice Joseph's story said, we are in fact under the absolute rule of a single man. Jackson vetoed laws passed by Congress, becoming the first president to assume this power. At one point, he dismissed his entire cabinet. The man we have made our president has made himself our despot, and the Constitution now lies in a heap at ruins at his feet, declared a senator from Rhode Island. When the way to his object lies through the Constitution, the Constitution has not the strength of a cobweb to restrain him from breaking through it. His critics dubbed him King Andrew. Jackson's first campaign involved implementing the policy of Indian removal, forcibly removing native peoples east of the Mississippi River to the land to the west. This policy applied only to the South. There were Indian communities in the North, the Mashpees of Massachusetts, for instance, but their numbers were small. James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans in 1826 was just one in the glut of romantic paeans to the vanishing Indian, the ghost of Indians past. We hear the rustling of their footsteps like that of the withered leaves of autumn, and they are gone forever, wrote Justice Story in 1828. Jackson directed his policy of Indian removal at the much bigger communities of native peoples in the southeast, the Cherokees, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, who lived in the homelands of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Jackson's home state. To this campaign, Jackson brought considerable military experience in 1814. In 1814, he led a coalition of U.S. and Cherokee forces against the Creeks. After that, the Creeks ceded more than 20 million acres of their land to the United States. In 1816 and 1817, Jackson then compelled his Cherokee allies to sign treaties selling to the United States more than 3 million acres for about 20 cents an acre. When the Cherokees protested, Jackson reputedly said, Look around and recollect what happened to our brothers of the Creeks. But the religious revival interfered with the removal. In 1816, evangelicals from the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions began attempting to convert the Cherokee, declaring a mission to make the whole tribe English in their language, civilized in their habits, and Christian in their religion. A mission that, if accomplished, would seem to defeat the logic of removal in the name of quote-unquote progress. Meanwhile, the Cherokee decided to proclaim their political equality and declare their independence as a nation. For centuries, Europeans had based their claims to lands in the New World on the arguments that the native peoples had no right to the land they inhabited, nor sovereignty over it, because they had no religion, or because they had no government, or because they had no system of writing. The Cherokees, with deliberation and purpose, challenged each of these arguments. In 1823, when the federal government tried to get the Cherokees to agree to move, the Cherokee National Council replied, it is the fixed and unalterable determination of this nation never again to cede one foot of land. A Cherokee man named Sequoia, who fought under Jackson during the Creek War, invented a written form of the language, not an alphabet, but a syllabary, with one character for every syllable. In 1825, the Cherokee nation began printing the phoenix in both English and using the syllabary in Cherokee. In 1826, it established a national capital at New Echota, just outside what is now Calhoun, Georgia. And in 1827, the National Council ratified a written constitution. South Carolina-born John C. Calhoun, Monroe's Secretary of War, pressed them, You must be sensible that it will be impossible for you to remain for any length of time in your present situation within the limits of Georgia or any other state. To which the Cherokees replied, We beg leave to observe and to remind you that the Cherokee are not foreigners, but original inhabitants of America, and that they now inhabit and stand on the soil of their own territory, and that they cannot recognize the sovereignty of any state within the limits of their territory. Jacksonians argued that in the march of progress the Cherokee had been left behind, unimproved, but the Cherokees were determined to call that bluff by demonstrating each of their improvements. In 1825, Cherokee property consisted of 22,000 cattle, 7,600 horses, 4,600 pigs, 12, 2,500 sheep, 725 looms, 2,488 spinning wheels, 172 wagons, 10,000 plows, 31 grist mills, 10 sawmills, 62 blacksmith shops, 8 cotton gins, 18 schools, 18 ferries, and 1,500 slaves. The writer John Howard Payne, who lived with the Cherokees in the 1820s, explained, 
When the Georgian asks, Shall savages infest our borders thus? The Cherokee answers him, Do we not read? Have we not schools, churches, manufacturers? Have we not laws, letters, a constitution? And do you call us savages? They might have prevailed. They had the law of nations on their side. But then in 1828, gold was discovered on Cherokee land, just 50 miles from New Echota, a discovery that doomed the Cherokee cause. When Jackson took office in March of 1829, he declared Indian removal one of his chief priorities and argued that the establishment of the Cherokee Nation violated Article 4 of Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. No new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state without that state's approval. Jackson's Indian Removal Act aroused the ire of reformers and revivalists. David Walker had argued that Indian removal was just another version of the colonizing trick. Catherine Beecher, disavowing public speaking but advocating letter writing, led an effort to submit a female petition opposing an Indian removal to Congress. So you can see here, I'm just pausing from the reading for a minute, you can see that the Second Great Awakening and the Reformers is kind of intermingling with the Jacksonian wishes of Indian removal. Back to the reading. After considerable debate, the Indian Removal Bill narrowly passed, the vote falling along sectional lines, New Englanders voting 28 to 9 against and Southerners 68 to 50, 15 in favor in the House, while in the Senate, New Englanders voted nearly uniformly against and Southerners unanimously in favor. The middle states were more divided, and yet the debate itself had raised for everyone broader questions about the nature of race. One senator from New Jersey inquiring, do the obligations of justice change the with the color of the skin? There remained the matter of the lawfulness of the act and the question of its enforcement. The Cherokees argued that the state of Georgia had no jurisdiction over them and that the case went to the Supreme Court. In Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, 1831, Chief Justice John Marshall said, if courts were permitted to indulge their sympathies, a case better calculated to excite them can scarcely be imagined. In his opinion, Marshall faithfully defined the Cherokee as domestic dependent nations, a legal entity, <clears throat> a new legal entity, not states and not quite nations either. In another case, the next year, Worcester v. Georgia, Marshall elaborated, the Cherokee nation then is a distinct community occupying its own territory in which the laws of Georgia can have no force and which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter. The acts of Georgia are repugnant to the Constitution, laws, and treaties of the United States. So Worcester versus Georgia, very pro-Indian uh, argument from John Marshall. In New England, Marshall's decision led tribes like the Penobscots and the Mashpees to press for their own independence. In 1833, the Mashpee people on Cape Cod published an Indian's appeal to the white man of Massachusetts, arguing, as our brethren, the white men of Massachusetts, have recently manifested much sympathy for the red men of the Cherokee Nation, we, the red men of the Mashpee tribe, consider it a, a favorable time to speak. We are not free. We wish to be so. Marshall's rulings in the Cherokee case, which touched on the nature of title, inevitably occasioned a pained discussion about the European settlement of North America and the founding of the United States. In 1835, Edward Everett, a Massachusetts legislator who'd led the fight against Indian removal in Congress, balked at the hypocrisy of Northern writers and reformers. Unless we deny altogether the rightfulness of settling the continent, unless we maintain that it was for the origin from the origin unjust and wrong to introduce the civilized race into America, and that the whole of what is now our happy and prosperous country ought to have been left, as it was found, the abode of barbarity and heathenism, I am not sure that any different result could have taken place. Jackson agreed, asking, would the people of Maine permit the Penobscot tribe to erect an independent government within their state? In the end, Jackson decided to ignore the Supreme Court. John Marshall has made his decision, he, rum he is rumored to have uh, said, the rumor appears to have been a wild one. Now let him enforce it. The leaders of a tiny minority of Cherokee signed a treaty, ceding the land to Georgia and setting a deadline for removal at May 23, 1838. By the time the deadline came, only 2,000 Cherokees had left for the West. 16,000 more refused to leave their homes. U.S. Army General Winfield Scott, a fastidious career military man from Virginia, known as Old Fuss and Feathers, arrived to force the matter. He begged the Cherokee to move voluntarily. I am an old warrior, and I have been present at many scenes of slaughter, he said, but spare me, I beseech you, the horror of witnessing the destruction of the Cherokees. On the forced march 800 miles westward, and by Jefferson's imagining, backward in time, 
One in four Cherokee died of starvation, exposure, or exhaustion on what became known as the Trail of Tears. By the time it was over, the U.S. government had resettled 47,000 southeastern Indians to the lands west of the Mississippi and acquired more than 100 million acres of land to the east. In 1839, in Indian Territory, what is now Oklahoma, the Cherokee men who'd signed the treaty were murdered by unknown assassins. By then, Jackson's two terms in office had come to an end. But during the years he had occupied the White House between 1829 and 1837, ignoring a decision made by the Supreme Court had been neither the last nor the least of Andrew Jackson's assertions of presidential power. Especially fraught was Jackson's relationship with his vice president, his first vice president, John C. Calhoun, Monroe's former Secretary of War, a fellow so stern and unyielding that one particularly shrewd observer dubbed him Cast Iron Man. Calhoun had served as John Quincy Adams' vice president, too, and his relationship with Jackson had been strained from the start. Matters worsened when Calhoun led the South Carolina's attempt to nullify, underline that nullify, a tariff established by Congress. Like the struggle over Indian removal, the debate over the tariff stretched the limits of the power of the Constitution to hold states together. So at this point, if you have not done so, you may want to pause and do the questions on Indian removal. We're now going to move to this question of nullification and the tariff. One night in 1832, if at a formal dinner, President Jackson and Vice President Calhoun battled the matter out over drinks. The president offered a toast to our federal union. It must be preserved. After Jackson sat down, Calhoun rose from his seat to offer his toast. The union, next to our liberty, the most dear. May we all remember that it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states. The much lesser political skills of former New York Governor Martin Van Buren, also at the dinner that night, were in evidence when he rose to give a third toast to a mutual forbearance and reciprocal concession. Between Jackson and Calhoun, there would be no forbearance and very little concession. Although the tariff cut the duty on imports in half, this new tariff still worried Southerners who argued that it put the interest of Northern manufacturers above Southern agriculturalists. The South provided two-thirds of American exports, almost entirely in the form of cotton, and consumed only one-tenth of its imports, leading its politicians to oppose the tariff by endorsing a position that became known as free trade. To protest the tariff, Calhoun wrote a treatise on behalf of the South Carolina legislature in which he developed the theory of constitutional interpretation under which he argued that the states had the right to declare federal laws null and void. Influenced by the Kentucky and Virginia resolves, drafted by Jefferson and Madison in 1798, and also by the Hartford Convention in 1812, in which the northern states had threatened to secede from the Union over their opposition to the war with Britain, Calhoun argued that if a state were to decide that a law passed by Congress was unconstitutional, the Constitution would have to be amended, and if such an amendment were not ratified, if it did not earn the necessary approval of three-quarters of the states, the objecting state would have the right to secede from the Union. The states had been sovereign before the Constitution was ever written, or even thought of, Calhoun argued, and they remained sovereign. Calhoun also, therefore, argued against majority rule. Nullification is fundamentally anti-majorian, majoritarian. If states can secede, the majority does not rule. The nullification crisis was less a debate about the tariff than it was about the debate about the limits of states' rights and the question of slavery, an early augury of the Civil War to come. South Carolina had the largest percentage of slaves of any region in the country, coming in the wake of David Walker's appeal and the challenge posed by the Cherokee Nation to the state of Georgia. Nullification represented South Carolina's attempt to reject the power of the federal government to set laws it found unfavorable to its interest. I want to pause for a minute. In 1831-1832, we have David Walker's uh, Black Abolitionist's Appeal, right? We also have William Lloyd Garrison's uh, uh, newspaper, Abolitionist newspaper from Massachusetts. We also have Nat Turner's Uprising, a slave uprising in Virginia, all happening at the same time. We have the Cherokee Nation decision, which seems to be threatening states' rights, uh, trying to say that Georgia can't force the, the Cherokee off. And now we have this, this tariff, which seems to be being forced on the South. And so the South is really getting paranoid after 1831 here. Jackson responded with a proclamation in which he called Calhoun's theory of nullification a metaphysical subtlery in pursuit of an impracticable theory. Jackson's case amounted to this. The United States is a nation. It existed before the states. Its sovereignty is complete. 
The Constitution of the United States, Jackson argued, forms a government, not a league. In the end, Congress adopted a compromise tariff, and South Carolina accepted it. Nullification is dead, Jackson declared, but the war was far from over. The nullification crisis hardened the battle lines between the sectionalists and the nationalists, while Calhoun became the leader of the pro-slavery movement, declaring that slavery is an indispensable part of Republican government. Jackson's feud with Calhoun meant that he had not the least wish for him to continue as his vice president during the second term. Remember, these guys are president and vice president. Reluctant to simply drop Calhoun from the ticket for fear of political reprisal, Jackson cast about for a subtler means by which he could get rid of his cast iron man. His eyes fell upon a new and short-lived political party, the Anti-Masons. In September of 1831, the Anti-Masons held the first presidential nominating convention in American history. Founded on the opposition to secret cabals like Masons or political caucuses, the Anti-Masons had decided to bar the idea of holding a gathering of delegates like the constitutional conventions that had been held year after year in the states. Unfortunately, the man the Anti-Masons chose as their nominee turned out to be a Mason. <laughs> But the Anti-Masons nominating convention left two legacies. The practice of granting to each state delegation a number of votes equal to the size of its delegation in the Electoral College, and the rule by which a nomination requires a, two two, a three-quarters vote. Two months after the Anti-Masons met, yet another short-lived party, the National Republican Party, held a convention of its own in which role was called of states, not in alphabetical order, but in geographical order, beginning with Maine, and working down the coast, causing no small consternation among the gentlemen from Alabama. Henry Clay, asked by letter if he would be willing to be nominated by these short-lived National Republicans, wrote back to say yes, but added that it was impossible for him to attend the convention in Baltimore without incurring the imputation of presumptuousness of, or indelicacy. Clay accept, accepted the nomination and set a precedent that lasted until Franklin Delano Roosevelt. For more than a century, no nominee accepted the nomination in person, and Roosevelt only did it because he was trying to put the point across that he was promising to offer Americans a new deal. At this point, to accept the presidential nomination in person was seen to be a little presumptuous and show what you weren't supposed to campaign. Still, the practice of nominating a presidential candidate at a national party convention might not have come to an American political tradition if Jackson hadn't decided that the Democratic Party ought to hold one, too, so that he could get rid of his disputatious vice president. Jackson and his advisors realized that if they left the nomination to the state legislatures, where Calhoun had a great deal of support, they'd be stuck with him again. Jackson, therefore, contrived to have the New Hampshire legislature call for a national convention and to nominate Jackson as president and his pliable former Secretary of State, New York Governor Martin Van Buren, as his running mate. In eight, the election of 1832 turned on the question of the National Bank. So I want to pause here for a minute, talk about nullification, answer the nullification questions and the tariff questions. We're now going to move on to 1832 and that election, and particularly the Bank of the United States, which I may have just answered one of your questions. The election of 1832 turned on the question of the National Bank. Like the battles over Indian removal and the tariff, Jackson's battle with the bank tested the power of the presidency. The issue was long-standing. Because the Constitution barred states from printing money, banks chartered by state legislatures printed their own money. Not legal tender, but bank notes signed by bank presidents. 347 banks opened up in the United States between 1830 and 1837. They printed their own money, producing more than 1,200 different kinds of bills. Under this notoriously unstable arrangement, counterfeiting was rife, and so was swindling, especially by land banks, set up to speculate on Western land. In 1816, Congress had chartered a second bank of the United States to help the nation recover from the devastation of the war with England. This is part of Clay's American system, right? In 1819, the Supreme Court had upheld the constitutionality of the bank. That's the McCullough version. The Bank of the United States served as a depository for all federal money. It handled its payments and revenues, including taxes. Nevertheless, it was a private bank, reporting to stockholders. Its economic influence was extraordinary. By 1830, its holdings of $35 million amounted to twice the annual expenses of the federal government. To its severest critics, the National Bank looked like an unelected fourth branch of government. Jackson hated all banks. I do not dislike your bank any more than all banks, he told the bank's president, Nicholas Biddle. Jackson believed that the Bank of the United States undermined the sovereignty of the people, defied their will, and 
and like all banks, had a corrupting influence on the nation by allowing a few moneyed capitalists to use public revenue to enjoy the benefit of it to the exclusion of many. In January 1832, with Jackson nearing the end of his term, Biddle submitted to Congress a request to renew the bank's charter, even though that the charter wasn't due to expire until 1836. Congress obliged. Henry Clay promised, Shall Jackson veto it? I will veto him. But in July 1832, Jackson did veto the bank bill, delivering an 8,000-word message in which he made clear that he believed the president has the authority to decide on the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress. So the president has the power, he says, to judge constitutionality. It is maintained by the advocates of the bank that its constitutionality in all its features ought to be considered as settled by the president and by the decision of the Supreme Court, Jackson said. To this conclusion, I cannot assent. Biddle called Jackson's veto message a manifesto of anarchy, but the Senate proved unable to override his veto. The bank war, said Edward Everett, is nothing less than a war of numbers against property. Jackson, man of the people, king of numbers of all the people, won in a rout. Jackson's bank veto unmoored the American economy. With the dissolution of the Bank of the United States, the stability that it provided, ballast in a ship's hull, floated away. Proponents of the National Bank had insisted on the need for federal regulation of paper currency. Jackson and his supporters, known as gold bugs, would have rather had no paper money at all. In 1832, $59 million in paper bills was in circulation. In 1836, $140 million. Without the National Bank's regulatory force, very little metal backed up this blizzard of paper, American banks holding only $10.5 million in gold. Both speculators and the president looked to the West. The wealth and the strength of the country are its population, and the best part of its population are cultivators of the soil, Jackson said, echoing Jefferson. Fleeing worsening economic conditions in the East and seeking new opportunities, Americans move West, alone and with families, on wagons and trails, on canals and steamboats, to Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Alabama, Mississippi, Missouri, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Michigan. They homesteaded on farms. They built cabins out of rough-hewn logs. They started newspapers and argued about politics. They built towns and churches and schools. I invite you to go west and visit one of our log cabins and number its inmates, said one India Indiana congressman. There you will find a strong, stout youth of 18 with his better half just commencing the first struggles of independent life. Thirty years from that time, visit them again, and instead of two, you will find that, that same family, 22. This is what I call the American Multiplication Table. Still, slavery haunted every step of westward settlement. Eliza Lovejoy, born in Maine, settled in St. Louis, where he printed abolitionist tracts, the distribution of which was illegal in slave states, leading abolitionists to call for free speech against Southerners' demands for free trade. In 1836, pro-slavery rioters destroyed Lovejoy's press. Lovejoy moved across the river to the free state of Illinois, where he and his black typesetter John Anderson reopened their business with new press. That, too, was destroyed by a mob, and when a third press arrived, Lovejoy, who was armed, was shot in the chest and killed, a martyr to the cause of free speech. To survey land and supervise settlement, Congress chartered the General Land Office. Surveyors laid the land out in grids of 640 acres. These they divided into 160-acre lots as the smallest unit to be offered for sale. By 1832, during a boom in land sales, the office was receiving 40,000 patents a year. The minimum purchase was reduced to 40 acres. In 1835, Congress increased the number of clerks working at the land office from 17 to 88, yet still they could not keep up with the volume of paperwork. From the south, American settlers crossed the border into Mexico, which had won independence from Spain in 1821. Mexico had trouble managing its sprawling north. Much of the land between its populous south, including its capital, Mexico City, and its most distant territory, Alta California, was much of it was desert and chiefly occupied by Apaches, Utes, and Yaqui Indians. As one Mexican governor said, our territory is enormous and our government weak. As early as 1825, John Quincy Adams had instructed the American minister to Mexico to try to negotiate a new boundary. The Mexican government needed the money, but it wouldn't sell its own land. As its minister, Manuel de, de Mier y Terran, argued, Mexico imitating the conduct of France and Spain, might alienate or cede unproductive lands in Africa or Asia, but how can it be expected to cut itself off from its own soil?
Mexico wouldn't sell its own land, but the Mexican territories of Coahuila and Texas, along the Gulf of Mexico, and the west and west of the state of Louisiana, proved particularly attractive to American settlers in search of new lands for planting cotton. If we do not take the present opportunity to people Texas, one Mexican official warned, day by day the strength of the United States will grow until it will annex Texas, Coahuila, Saltillo, and Nuevo Leon. At the time, Texas included much of what later became Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. In 1835, Americans in Texas rebelled against Mexican rule, waging a war under the command of a political daredevil named Sam Houston. In 1836, Texas declared its independence, founding the Republic of Texas, with Houston as its president. Mexico's president, General Antonio, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, warned that if he were to discover that the U.S. government had been behind the Texas Rebellion, he would march his army to Washington and place upon its capital the Mexican flag. When Houston sent a proposal to Congress requesting annexation to join the United States, the measure failed for three reasons. First, Jackson feared annexation would provoke a war with Mexico, which did not recognize Texas' independence. Second, from the point of view of the United States, which, along with Great Britain and France, did recognize Texas' independence, Texas was a foreign country, which meant that its annexation was altogether a different issue than it had been in 1825 when John Quincy Adams, as Secretary of State, had sought to acquire the territory. Finally, if Texas were admitted to the Union, it would enter as a slave state. Quincy Adams, who, having lost at the presidency, had become a member of the House, filibustered the annexation proposal for three weeks. The people of the United States, he said, dearly as they loved the Union, would prefer its total disillusion to the act of annexation of Texas. The American Anti-Slavery Society flooded Congress with tens of thousands of abolitionist petitions. When Quincy Adams tried to get the petitions a hearing, Southern legislators silenced him under the terms of a gag rule that banned from the floor of Congress any discussion of anti-slavery petitions, another triumph for the opponents of free speech. So know the gag rule. It wouldn't allow, it wouldn't allow any anti-slavery talk or petitions in Congress. Southern slave owners, a tiny minority of Americans, amounting to about 1% of the population, deployed the rhetoric of states' rights and free trade, by which they meant free trade, trade free from federal government regulation. But in fact, they desperately needed and relied on the power of the federal government to defend and to extend the institution of slavery. The weakness of their position lay behind their efforts to silence dissent. Beginning in 1836, Ohio Democrat Thomas Morris introduced petitions denouncing slavery, calling for its abolition in the District of Columbia, and urging the overturning of a ban on sending abolitionist literature through the mail, only to have the petitions suppressed. Morris, uncouth and self-taught, had been raised by his Baptist preacher father to hate slavery. Early in 1838, he damned the putrid mass of prejudice which interests had created to keep the colored race in bondage. Later that year, he told an Ohio newspaper that he had always believed slavery to be wrong in principle, in practice, in every country, and under every condition of things. Unsurprisingly, he was not re-elected. In February of 1839, knowing that he would never again hold public office, he let loose, delivering the fiercest anti-slavery speech yet voiced on the Senate floor. Borrowing from Jacksonian indictment of the money power, he coined the phrase slave power. Morris described the struggle as a battle between democracy and two united aristocracies. The aristocracy of the North, operating by the power of a corrupt banking system, and the aristocracy of the South, which operated by the power of the slave system. Morris closed by stating his faith that democracy would prevail and the Negro will yet be set free. The debate over Texas, along with the election of 1836, illustrated just how powerfully Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams shaped national politics. Long after the end of each of their presidencies, Jackson held the strings of the Democratic Party, while Quincy Adams steered the erratic course of the Whig Party. Jackson decided not to run for a third term, but just as he connived to rid himself of Calhoun in 1832, he was determined to choose his successor. Once again, King Andrew masqueraded as the champion of the common man. I want to pause here real quick. We're now getting away from the Texas questions to the um, the new party system, the, two, the second party system, in which we have the Democrats and the Whigs. Jackson, of course, is a Democrat. John Quincy Adams, who's not running again, but he's the kind of man behind the Whig party. And Henry Clay will be their star. In 1835, Jackson issued a call for a Democratic nominating convention in an extraordinary letter published first in a Tennessee newspaper. 
I consider the true policy of the Friends of the Republican Principles to send delegates, fresh from the people, to a general convention for the purpose of selecting candidates for the presidency and vice presidency, and that to impeach that selection before it is made, or to resist it when it is fairly made, as an emanation of executive power, is to assail the virtue of the people, and in effect to oppose their right to govern. Now, for all his flummery about the virtue of the people and their right to govern, the point of this convention was to assure the nomination of Jackson's hand-picked successor, Martin Van Buren, and to allow for Van Buren to contrive for his choice, Richard Johnson, to win the vice presidential nomination. The colony did not go unnoticed. Tennessee, whose support for Jackson had long since begun to waver, refused to send a delegation to the convention held in Baltimore. Unwilling to forfeit Tennessee's 15 electoral votes at the convention, Van Buren's convention manager, New York Senator Silas Wright, went to a tavern and found a Tennessean who had just happened to be in the city, Edward Rucker, who became a one-man, 15-vote delegation. Ruckerize became a verb. It means to commit political skullduggery by packing a convention. But Quincy Adams' party found itself in a still greater disarray. Disorganized and dispersed, the Whigs failed to hold a nominating convention and could not decide on a single candidate. Four different Whigs ran for president, splitting the party and leaving a wide path for the Democratic candidate Van Buren to ride to electoral victory. Van Buren took office in March 1837. Five weeks later, the nation's financial system fell apart in the worst financial disaster of American history, second only to the crash of 1929. The stock market collapsed. The blackness of darkness still hangeth over it, one New Yorker wrote from Wall Street that April. By the fall of 1839, nine out of ten eastern factories had closed. The poor broke into shops, only to find their shelves empty. What began with the Panic of 1837 ended only after a seven-year-long depression, well into a decade of despair known as the Hungry Forties. Whigs dubbed the new president Martin Van Ruin, which was unfair, since the fall was the result of Jackson's decisions, not Van Buren's, the consequence, above all, of unregulated banking industry. But if the suffering was Jacksonian, so was his relief. The Panic of 1837 democratized bankruptcy protection and led to the abolition of debtors' prisons. In 1810, a New York lawyer named Joseph Dewey Frey, who claimed to have spent 16 years in debtors' prison, had estimated that in the aftermath of the Panic of 1809, 10% of New York's freemen had been arrested for debt. Americans boast that they have done away with torture, Fay had written, but the debtor's prison is torture. Fay had gone to Albany and successfully lobbied the legislature to pass an expanded insolvency law for imprisoned debtors. 2,500 debtors availed themselves of the discharge in the law's first nine months. Earlier bankruptcy laws had protected only stockbrokers, but the new law set a precedent. It was the first legislation anywhere to offer bankruptcy to everyone. In 1819, the Supreme Court had ruled it unconstitutional. Still, a turn had come. New York ab abolished debtors' prisons in 1831, and in 1841, Congress passed a federal law offering bankruptcy protection to everyone. Within two years, 41,000 Americans had filed for bankruptcy. Two years later, the law was repealed, but state laws continued to offer bankruptcy protection, and still more significantly, debtors' prisons were gone for good. In Britain, and all of Europe except Portugal, offenders were still being thrown in debtors' prison, a plot that animated many a 19th century novel. In the United States, debtors could declare bankruptcy and begin again. The forgiveness of debts fostered a spirit of risk-taking that fueled American enterprise. Tocqueville marveled at the strange indulgence which is shown to bankrupts in the United States. In this, he observed, Americans differ not only from nations of Europe, but from all the commercial nations of our time. A nation of debtors, Americans came to see that most people who fall victim into debt are victims of business cycle and not the fate or divine retribution or the wheel of fortune. The nation's bankruptcy laws, even as they came and went again, made taking risks less risky for everyone, which meant that everyone took more risks. Martin Van Ruin didn't stand at much of a chance at re-election in 1840. Voters blamed him, both him and his party for the misery caused by Jackson. The Whigs, unsurprisingly, but in a move that would become characteristic of American campaigning, argued that the Democrats, the so-called party of the people, had in fact failed the people. The Democratic Party, Whigs claimed, had become the party of tyranny and corruption, and the Whigs were the real people's party. The Whigs are the Democrats, if there must be a party by that name, one Whigging system. You're going to see this play out in 2020 as well where you have uh, the Democrats saying that Trump said he was for the people, but you know they failed the people and are corrupt, and now the Democrats are the true people's party. This was the first election where the 
playing the People's Party thing became a thing. For their presidential candidate, the Whigs nominated 72-year-old William Henry Harrison, ran him as a war hero, and tried to pitch him as a Jacksonian man of the people, and even a frontiersman, which required considerable stretching of the truth. Harrison had served as governor of the Indiana Territory and as a senator from Ohio, but he came from an eminent forebearers. His father, a Virginia plantation owner, had signed the Declaration of Independence. Writing in 1839, Harrison's campaign biographer tried, in the People's Presidential Candidate, to present the staggeringly wealthy Harrison as a humble farmer who had never been rich. Harrison exerted himself, delivering at a hotel in Ohio the first ever presidential campaign speech, but his campaign urged him not to say too much. Let him then rely entirely on the past, they advised. Let him say not a single word about his principles or his creed. Let him say nothing, promise nothing. Critics dubbed him General Mum. Democrats mocked Harrison by suggesting that, so poor as he was, he lived in a log cabin and drank nothing but hard cider. Whigs took this as a political gift. Calling Harrison the log cabin candidate, they campaigned, the log cabins, they campaigned in log cabins mounted on wheels and hitched to horses, handing out mugs of hard cider along the road. Harrison, of course, lived in a mansion, but after the log cabin campaign of 1840, few presidential candidates, whether they started out poor or whether they started out rich, failed to run as log cabin candidates. You gotta make yourself seem like you're poor, like the people. Busy dueling for the mantle of the party of the people, neither the Whigs nor the Democrats offered a plausible solution to the problem of slavery. They barely addressed it. This led to the founding of new parties, including the Evangelical Liberty Party, formed in 1839. We must abolish slavery, the party pledged, and as sure as the sun rises, we shall in five or six years run over slavery at full gallop unless she pulls herself up and gets out of the way of liberty's cavalry. It's bid to evangelical Whigs, vote as you pray. So this is again the echoes of the Second Great Awakening and reform movements. The religious revival that had brought women into moral reform also carried them into politics. In the 1820s and 1830s, Jacksonian democracy involved a lot of brawls. When the reformer Fanny Wright tried to attend a convention in 1836, she was called a female man. But while Democrats banned women from their rallies, Whigs welcomed them. In the 1840s, as one contemporary observed, the ladies were Whigs. Beginning with the Whig party, long before women could vote, they brought into the parties a political style they perfected first as abolitionists and then as prohibitionists, the moral crusade, pious and uncompromising. No election had been the same since. So women starting to play a role in the conventions and the party politics, particularly the Whigs. During the years that Democrats ran against the Whigs, both parties incorporated both Jacksonian populism, the endless appeals to the people, and the spirit of evangelical reform. Campaign rallies borrowed their style and zeal from revival meetings. Walt Whitman complained about the never-ending audacity of elected persons, damning men in politics as members of the establishment, no matter their appeals to the people. But those appeals were hardly meaningless. Undeniably, the nature of American democracy had changed. Not only were more men able to vote, but more men did vote. Voter turnout rose from 27% in 1824 to 58% in 1838 and to 80% in 1840. Harrison, the Whig, won by a landslide. He then promptly died of pneumonia. His vice president and successor, John Tyler, came to be called his accidency, but the log cabin, like the female reformer, proved long-lived. So did the battle for the soul of the nation in the age of machines. The United States is the country of the future, Ralph Waldo Emerson proclaimed in February of 1844, rhapsodizing about a country of beings, of beginnings, I'm sorry, of projects, of vast designs and expectations. That spring, Samuel F. B. Morse sat at a desk in the chambers of the U.S. Supreme Court and tapped out a message on his new telegraph machine along wires stretched between Washington and Baltimore, paid for by Congress. His first message, in a code no longer secret, what hath God wrought? Meanwhile, a railroad line that began in Boston reached Emerson's hometown of Concord, Massachusetts. I hear the whistle of the locomotive in the woods, Emerson wrote in his journal. It is the voice of the civility of the 19th century saying, here I am. The United States had been founded as a political experiment. It seemed natural that it should advance and grow through the other kinds of experimentation. By December, telegraph wires would be installed along lines cut by train tracks, through woods and meadows and even mountains, and Americans began imagining a future in which both the railroad and the telegraph would reach all the way across the continent. 
the greatest revolution of modern times and indeed of all time for the amelioration of society, the, the helpful benefit of society, has been affected by the magnetic telegraph, the New York Sun announced, proclaiming the annihilation of space. Time was being annihilated too. News spread in a flash. As penny press printer James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald pointed out, the telegraph appeared to make it possible for the whole nation to have the same idea at the same time. The progress of the age has almost outstripped human belief, Daniel Webster said. The future is known only to omniscience. The progress, progress of the age, the rapid growth of the population, the unending chains of machines, and the astonishing array of goods combined to produce an unceasing and often uneasy fascination with what lay ahead. What next? Political economists in particular busied themselves with working out a system for understanding the relationship between the present and the future. In Paris, a philosopher named Karl Marx began making predictions about the consequences of capitalism. He saw in the increase in the production of goods a decrease in the value of labor, and a widening inequality between the rich and the poor. The workers become all the poor and the, wealth he produ and the more wealth he produces, Marx argued in 1844. The devaluation of the world of men is in direct proportion to the increasing value of the world of things. American thinkers pondered this problem too. Emerson wrote, "'Tis the day of the chattel, web to weave and corn to grind. Things are in a saddle and ride mankind." In the United States, the political debate about the world of people and the world of things contributed to the agonizing debate about slavery. Can people be things? Meanwhile, the geographical vastness of the United States meant that the anxiety about the machinery of industrial capitalism took the form not of Marxism, with its argument that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, but instead of a romance with nature and with land and with all things rustic. Against the factory, Americans posed not a socialist utopia, but the log cabin. It did not happen to me to be born in a log cabin, Webster, a three-time presidential aspirant, sighed, despairing of his biographical deficiency in the age of the log cabin presidency. In other words, he was rich. But the most famous log cabin in the 19th century America was built, was one built in 1844 by Emerson's 27-year-old friend, Henry David Thoreau. The year the railroad reached Concord, Thoreau built a log cabin on a patch of land Emerson owned on Walden Pond, a kettle pond a little more than a mile outside of town. He dug a cellar at the site of the Woodchuck's burrow. He, burrowed an a an, he borrowed, an, borrowed an axe and hewn framing timbers out of white pine. We boast that we belong to the 19th century and are making the most rapid strides of any nation, Thoreau wrote, from the 10 by 15 foot cabin he built over that cellar at a cost of $28.12. He used the boards from an old shanty for siding. He mixed his own plaster from lime, 240, uh, that was I, and horsehair, 31 cents, more than I needed. He moved in fittingly on the 4th of July. The chimney he built before winter from secondhand bricks marked real progress, but he didn't think the same could be said for the nation's rapid strides and vast designs. He had the gravest doubts about what the machine was doing to the American soul, the American people, and the land itself. The telegraph? We are in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas. But Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. The postal system? I have never received in my life more than two or one or two letters that were worth the postage. The nation's much vaunted network of newspapers? We are a race of tipmen and soar but little higher in our intellectual flights than the columns of the daily paper. Banks and railroads? Men have an indistinct notion that if they keep us keep up this activity of joint stocks and spades long enough, all will at length ride somewhere, and to next to no time, and for nothing. But though a crowd rushes to the depot and the conductor shouts all aboard, when the smoke is blown away and the vapor condensed, it will be perceived that a few are riding, but the rest are run over. Instead of Marx, America had Thoreau. Thoreau's experiment wasn't a business, it was anti-business. He paid attention to what things cost because he tried never to buy anything. Instead, he bartered and lived on 27 cents a week. At his most entrepreneurial, he planted a field of beans and realized a profit of $8.71. I was determined to know beans, he wrote in a particularly beautiful and elegant chapter, uh, elegiac chapter called The Bean Field. He worked for cash only six weeks out of the year and spent the rest of his time reading and writing, planting beans and picking huckleberries. Mr. Thoreau is thus at war with the political economy of the age, one critic complained. Thoreau had chosen not to be ridden by the machine, not to live in the restless, nervous, bustling, trivial 19th century, but to stand or sit thoughtfully while it goes by. One pressing question woke him up every morning, as regularly as the screech of the whistle of the train that chugged by his cabin on tracks 
built just up the hill from Walden Pond, where he had where he had hoped to still his soul. Were all these vast designs and rapid strides worth it? Thoreau thought not. He came to this truth. They are but improved means to an unimproved end, an unimproved goal. And still the trains chugged along, and the factories hummed, and the banks opened and closed, and the presses printed newspapers, and the telegraph wires reached across the nation in one great unending thrum.